say it? <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, Ray. Okay, I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, workshop that we're having here with Jewel concerning the, uh, not Jewel, Transco, too many workshops. Uh, giving you an update on what's happening on the power lines, on the upgrading from the two towers to monopoles, and it's going to be conducted by Shannon Brex Neves. She's uh, from New York Transco, and she'll give you more information. And you can, we're going to put the PowerPoint on our web page, so if you want to really study the details, you can see it there. Thank you, Ray, and thank you, everybody, for um, inviting us back to give you an update on the New York Energy Solution Project. As Ray mentioned, my name is Shannon Back Savannas. I'm the stakeholder and communications lead for New York Transco. So you'll be seeing me pretty regularly as the project continues. I also have with me a couple of colleagues from the project, uh, Nicole Marin, who's on the outreach team with me, and David Carr, who's with our project management team. And so depending on questions that folks have at the end, uh, I may call upon them to come and help out to answer them. So again, thanks for having us. Um, as Ray said, we will make this available in whatever format folks need to uh, gain access to it. There are some copies on the back table there if you'd like to take some. We also have copies of our fact sheet and a summary of the Article 7 application that we submitted with the Public Service Commission, um, as well as an invitation to an upcoming agricultural forum that we're hosting. So please feel free to grab whatever you'd like, and we have a lot of this up on our website as well. So today, the purpose is to give you an update on the New York Energy Solution Project since we submitted our Article 7 application in October of 2019. Uh, there's a few reminder slides here to go over just the contents of the project before we get into some of the updates. The New York Energy Solution Project, which is being developed by New York Transco. New York Transco is an organization created by affiliates of Con Edison, National Grid, Avon Grid, which is RG&E and NYSEG, and Central Hudson. The sole purpose for New York Transco is to develop transmission solutions that are in the best interest of customers that relieve congestion on the transmission system and facilitate clean energy resources, which is exactly what the New York Energy Solution Project does. This project stays entirely within existing utility rights of way and replaces aging infrastructure that's been out in the right of way for over 80 years. Uh, the project will stay on either the existing right-of-way or on utility-owned property, and it goes from Skodak through 11 communities and terminates down in Pleasant Valley. And we'll go through geographically the components of the project in just a second. The timetable that the project's on, we were selected in a competitive process by the New York Independent System Operator in April of 2019. We uh, submitted our first application with the Public Service Commission, the Article 7 application, which kicks off our permitting process. We submitted that in October of 2019. Uh, we hope to have all permits and approvals in hand by mid-2021 in order to start construction and put the project in service at the end of 2023. Uh, we'll go through, again, like I said, from the north to the south. As you're going to see, there's going to be some changes in the right-of-way. In total, once the project is in service, we'll have about 230 less structures in the right-of-way once we've been, we're completed. Starting up in Skodak, we will build a new switching station on utility-owned property. From that switching station, we will begin a 22-mile upgrade to the existing transmission facilities. That includes removing the existing lattice style structures that are in the right of way. Those lattice style structures hold two 115 kilovolt lines. We will replace that with a single monopole structure that will hold a 115 kilovolt line and a new 345 kilovolt line. That configuration will go from Skodak down to Clovrick. Once we hit Clovrick, Once we hit Claverick, we will be rebuilding the existing Churchtown switching station, which is on utility-owned property. And then we'll continue the upgrade for 32 miles, and of course, Clinton's in this section of the upgrade. Um, that upgrade will remove two lattice-style structures. Those lattice-style structures today will hold four 115 kilovolt lines, and we will replace that with a single monopole structure that will hold 
115 kilovolt line and a new 345 kilovolt line. This configuration, again, removes two structures and replaces it with one for that 32 miles. The project then terminates at the Pleasant Valley substation, which is down in Pleasant Valley. It's an existing substation. We'll be adding some new equipment within that substation. And um, you can see the substation right there down in the bottom right-hand corner. And about eight-tenths of the mile northwest of the substation, we'll be building on utility-owned property a new capacitor bank station uh, just south of Van Wagner Road. This capacitor bank station will, will, um, is for an important purpose for the project. It's to increase the capacity of the line during peak times, like in summertime when folks may have air conditioners running. Uh, we can increase the capacity of the line with this technology. There'll be the capacitor bank station here in Pleasant Valley. There'll also be equipment, capacitor bank equipment up in Skodak at the new switching station that we're constructing. In order to build this station, we obviously have to connect it back into the system, which requires us building a short connection line from the Van Wagner capacitor bank station into the Pleasant Valley substation. That will require us to do a little bit of line work for the two existing 345 kV lines that are in that right-of-way. We'll be taking them off of, uh, they currently exist on two lattice style structures. We'll be taking them off of those two structures and putting them on a single monopole at what's labeled locations one, two, and three. And then at location number two, we'll start building the connection line from the capacitor bank station to bring it into the Pleasant Valley substation. That will require us to build two structures at location two, again, all staying within the existing right of way, another structure at location number three, and then uh, uh, two other structures at locations four and four. At locations four and four, there are two existing lattice style structures that would remain there just as they are today. Again, all of this work stays within the existing right of way. And in this section, um, we do have height increases for the structures. The two tallest structures would be at location number three. They are today 130 and 145 feet. When this section's done, they would be 170 and 175 feet. Those are the only two structures that reach that height in the entire project. The, the rest of the project, um, including in Clinton, you see about an average 10-foot height increase from the existing structures that are out there today. The existing structures, um, lattice-style structures on average are about 80 feet. When we're done the project, they'll be on average 90 feet. We will also be um, upgrading one set of structures that go in Livingston that go to the Blue Stores tap uh, substation. Uh, these are existing um, H-frame wooden structures. We'll be replacing them with like structures that are about 15 feet taller for that two-mile segment that goes into the Blue Store substation. This is just a quick snapshot of the work that we're going to be doing here in Clinton. The blue dashed line represents the existing right-of-way that we'll be working within. You have about eight miles of line work that we would be doing here in Clinton. We would be removing 118 structures and replacing them with 59 structures. So there would be, would be 59 structures less in the corridor than there are today. The um, average heights for the structures in Clinton range from 85 to 95 feet. There are, um, uh, the lowest structures we would have would be 75 feet here in Clinton. And the tallest structure, there's one structure at 110 feet. And that is about um, an 18-foot difference than that current structure today. It's a structure that's down kind of in a valley. That's, that's why we have a height increase there. That's over by Browning Road and Clinton Hollow Road. Um, this is a little difficult to read on a slide, but it is something we do have available. It's a, just a quick bird's eye view snapshot of all of the work the project is undertaking town by town um, to show you the structures that are there today um, that'll be removed, the structures that we are putting in, and sort of the difference between those numbers, as well as all of the station work that we're going to be completing for the project.
So the, the real reason why we're here is to give you an update on uh, the project activities since the last time we came and presented to the town. And the biggest thing that's occurred is that we submitted our Article 7 application, which is the key application we need here in the state of New York for um, construction of the project. This application is submitted to the Public Service Commission, and it functions as a one-stop shop uh, permitting effort where all of the state agencies participate in the, this Article 7 process. Uh, we submitted that application on the 18th of October. Right now, it's being reviewed by the Public Service Commission. Um, we did come back, they did come back uh, Christmas Eve with two deficiencies on our application, which we responded to on January 16th. Those deficiencies dealt with um, needing for some additional mapping information in the application, as well as some information on additional permitting that we're required to do for the project. So that's been updated and is available on the uh, Public Service Commission's website. Uh, looking at the application, it's a 4,300-page document. It's extremely dense. Um, it is publicly available, open for you to review any piece of it that you'd like. What we did to try to make things um, a little bit easier to digest is we went back through the application with the eye of what have stakeholders been asking us regularly when we've been going to towns and holding meetings. And so we, we sort of narrowed that down to a four-page uh, summary, which is available in the back, and that's what's reflected here today. So environmental impact is often a question that's asked. Um, it, details on environmental issues are included in exhibit four of our application. We've done a number of technical studies that are required by the Article 7 application, and they look at wild and endangered um, threatened species. Uh, it looks at the topography. Um, it looks at soils, um, agricultural lands, uh, cultural resources archaeological resources, it's a whole really wide um, view of things that we have to do technical studies on. And so essentially, to boil it down into a very simple way, uh, while there may need maybe a need for certain environmental mitigation or controls during construction, overall the project has very little or no permanent impacts to environmental resources in the area. And there will be a number of agencies that will require us to put in, again, certain environmental controls as we advance toward construction in order to protect um, various environmental habitats. So there may be things like matting that we would do uh, to protect environmentally sensitive areas. They could require us to put hay bales to prevent runoff. There's a whole host of things that could be put in place. And that gets determined in, the, in a phase of the, the Article 7 process called the environmental management and construction planning process. So that comes a little later. But there are things that we've obviously started to look at to um, answer some of these areas. Um, EMF, electric and magnetic fields, often comes up as a question from folks. Uh, we have to do a study on EMF, and we did a study on 16 representative portions of the right-of-way uh, to look at what EMF would be at the edge of right-of-way, and the state has guidelines that we have to meet for the project. Uh, we will meet the state guidelines for all of those, all of the route, all of the representative portions that we studied. And in fact, there is a portion today in Pleasant Valley that's out of compliance. The project will bring it back into compliance. We do have an EMF fact sheet that further details what EMF is and the, the study that was conducted. And so we're happy to provide that. It's up on our website. Effect on communications, um, we often get asked, will my cell phone be affected um, by construction or the line work? Will uh, my cable TV be affected? There's no adverse effects on communication from this project's construction or operation. Transportation, I know this is a topic that we've discussed here in Clinton, um, impact on local roads when we come in and do construction. Uh, that's something that we have to sit down with each municipality, um, the counties, the state, to really come up with a detailed traffic management plan. Uh, but as it, as it uh, relates to the application itself, there are no permanent impacts to local roads from the construction or operation of this project. Again, we would come up with the tra detailed traffic management plan working closely with all of the appropriate entities. And if there are uh, particular concerns or measures that need to be taken, that gets put into that plan. And then if there's restoration needed at the end of the project based on construction, uh, that's something we would come back and, and restore. 
Alternatives are often um, cited as a question. Uh, were there other projects looked at? Other alternatives looked at for this project? Yes, New York ISO put our project along with others through a competitive process. And ultimately, our project was selected as the most cost efficient cost effective and efficient way to meet the state's goals and needs. Um, underground, can the project be underground? That's also a question that we often get, get asked. New York ISO did look at that and found that it was cost prohibitive to underground the project. We of course have the application available. Um, you can access it through our website to get to the Public Service Commission's website, but um, the towns receive copies of this. There are libraries with, with copies of the application as well for review, and the case stays open until um, we get our approval. So there's plenty of time to review everything and comment on it. This is just a depiction of the transmission line design. Um, so you can see uh, a little bit closer up the components of the, the structure itself. Um, we have, uh, on average, a 90-foot monopole that we'll be putting in. The top arm of the monopole is about 38 and a half feet across, and then the lower arm is about 51 feet across. So just to give some additional perspective, again, this is in the application, Exhibit 5, as well as there's information on Exhibit E1. Um, Mapping, I know it's really important for folks to have a sense of what's going to happen and where it's going to happen. Again, we're staying all within that existing right-of-way, so you have a good idea for location. Uh, but what we did is we took the detailed maps that were included in Exhibit 2 of the Article 7 application and put them into a user-friendly um, format, electronic format on the website, town by town. This is a Google Earth-based platform, so you can go on there, you can zoom in, zoom out, you can see where the current structures are today and where the new structures are proposed to go, um, as well as to see where vegetation work is planned for the project. And again, all of that is still preliminary at this point, but it does give a sense of what we're planning to do as the project is advances, and it also provides a good uh, point for us to sit down and have kitchen table discussions with individual landowners about where transmission structures are planning to go. So I, I encourage you to check out your town, check out Clinton's page so you can see um, where all of the structures are planned to go for your area. The, this is a very high level basic construction process that we will go through. This will get more detailed, again, in the environmental management and construction planning process, but we anticipate kicking off construction in mid-2021 and completing that and putting the project in service at the end of 2023. Um, what we do first is we go in and we prepare the site. So we would be putting matting down, setting up the lay down yards, getting the site prepped with vegetation removal so that we can get um, construction underway. We would then do our environmental controls, again, what comes out of that EM and CP process. Uh, the, again, that could be matting, hay bales, there's a, a variety of techniques that could potentially be put in place for environmental protection and controls. And then we would actually start the transmission uh, line building. The, the structures, again, they're a 90-foot structure on average. They do not come as a 90-foot structure. They come in sections and pieces, and that's transported to the right-of-way, and they are assembled on site. We will be drilling the foundations for each of the structures. There's no blasting for this. Um, we will be assembling, um, erecting the structures, putting them in the drilled holes, and using concrete for the, the foundations for in those holes. We will then string wire um, and essentially you know, get the project to where it needs to be, and then we'll remove the uh, old structures. The old structures will be removed. Um, right now, what they're saying is at least four feet down. There are individual concrete pillar foundations. Those will be removed four feet down into the ground so that there's no equipment or anything that could get caught up on the old foundations where the old structures are today. Um, and then once all of that process is done, we come back in and we restore um, any of the access roads, the right-of-way, anything that may have been damaged during construction, we come back in and restore things to as they were before construction. 
So the Article 7 is a, a pretty lengthy and detailed process that the Public Service Commission and all of the agencies undertake with um, us as the applicant. There's a lot of public involvement incorporated in this, um, but we are in the very early stages of this process. As I mentioned, we submitted the application, we received the deficiency notice, we responded to that, and now we're waiting for our application to be deemed complete. Um, we hope that'll happen in the very near future, and then the Public Service Commission would issue their schedule, and then we'd know better the sort of timetable when all of these other activities would happen, including public statement hearings. Um, public statement hearings will be a place where folks can get involved and participate and hear about the project as well as make public comments, but there are a variety of ways that um, folks can get involved in the Article 7 process now before we get to that stage, which include reading up on all of the uh, Article 7, the whole application up on the DMM website, submitting comments to the actual docket, and that stays open until the project has um, been given all of its approvals. And you can subscribe to be on a service list to get information, or you could subscribe to become a party to the actual uh, Article 7 application to the filing. All of that's up and available on the website for forms to participate. Um, our next step, we're continuing to have conversations like this with all of the route communities as well as other interested stakeholders. Um, we are starting our geotechnical work. We actually already started our geotechnical work at the substations and we'll soon be getting it on the transmission route. What that consists of is bringing out a, a, a drill that's about the size of a skid steer with a couple of pickup trucks and they go out there and they drill down into the earth to take out soil samples. And those soil samples are needed for the transmission line design and engineering to continue to progress that piece of, of work. So it's a pretty important piece of our effort. Um, again, we've already started the substation geotechnical effort and we're, we hope to start the transmission line work in, in the very near future. Um, we'll continue with all of our permitting activities, including the art participating in the Article 7 process, but we have other permits that we need to obtain from the Army Corps of Engineers. We'll also be talking to the FAA because of nearby airports, uh, but we're really focused on that right now in, in, the, um, in the project effort. As I mentioned, we have the Agricultural Forum coming up on the 4th of February at the Cornell Cooperative Extension over in Hudson. And we invite everybody to participate in that and really hope those folks that have animals or agricultural activities in and around the right of way that we get their participation to start getting some data from, from those folks directly before we, we get into the construction phase. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions or elaborate on any piece of this. I'm not that tall. I got several questions. I've been on this project since 2013, so I have a lot of questions. Uh, one comment, just so you know, uh, this application to the uh, Public Service Commission, we have two copies in town. One's in the library and one's in the town clerk's office. They're in notebooks. They're up about 30 inches high of notebooks, full of detail, no plot, but enjoy if you really like to know the details of everything that's been submitted. You can look at it on your computer too, but sometimes that's harder to see. The next one is <clears throat> tree cutting. What's gonna be the tree cutting situation? Because they have not really been cutting back on those power lines to boundary line to boundary line like they did on the other power lines here. And with 345, I think you're gonna be required by federal law that you gotta cut from power line edge of property to the other. Is that true or what? So there is some um, vegetation work that's required for the project in order to clear it in certain sections where we ha do not have a fully cleared right of way. That is included on the mapping that I alluded to by each town. It's a green shaded area where we're anticipating some tree cutting. Um, so that, that is something that we're going to have to do and it is included in the application. Tell landowners about it? Like Absolutely, right yes. Absolutely, and we have a, a vegetation management fact sheet that kind of lays out how we go about doing this to the general process that's undertaken, but I'll let Nicole fill in some more gaps. I just wanted to add on uh, the 
areas that are listed in the website and in Exhibit 2. That's um, the areas of possible vegetation removal. It's not concrete yet by any means. It still has to be examined. So could be, but not final. The question we had from the audience is a resident asked, are they going to fully remove big trees as they cut them down, or are they going to leave them there? And who owns them? That's another uh, more to come that is um, examined and detailed in the environmental management and construction plan, which we're developing over the next year. So I'm sure we'll be have co having conversations with folks um, as we develop that. And if that if you are uh, a nearby landowner that is something you're interested in it would be helpful to let us know that so we can start marking that off we do keep a pretty comprehensive database of requests that we get so Uh, we don't. We will not exceed any of the right of way boundaries. We have to stay within the existing right of way. Nothing beyond that. So that wasn't us. That would have been National Grid, um, probably that you're referring to. So I, I can't comment on that. I, I don't know the details, but we have to stay within the the right of way. Now there may be areas of trees that haven't been removed that are within the right of way that need, will need to be removed for construction, but I'd have to look specifically at the property you're referring to to comment better. Uh, there's another rule on that from the federal government. If the power company deems that a tree beyond the right of way, right of way is really land that is owned by Transco or National Grid or whoever the company is, but it's not an easement, it's really their land. And that's what we're talking about with a right of way, that amount. I didn't think it was 250. I think, I think for this one, it's only 125, but is it 250 on this one over here? Okay, because I know the big one over there is 250. Yeah. The east side, the one that power line that's up here on the hill, back here. No, nope, nope, they're not going on that one. That one's done. <clears throat> there, were there were proposals several years ago that looked over there, but that was not the one that was selected. The one you're referring to was not selected. It's the one that Ray was mentioning that was selected by New York ISO. Okay, the next one I have is how deep are the pole holes? Just for curiosity. I mean, uh, and I mention this because this past, not this winter, last winter, Central Hudson went through my property replacing lots of poles, you know, like normal household poles. And they brought this big machine in and it took an inordinate amount of time to drill through the hard rocks that we have here. And uh, just curious how deep you have to go. And they weren't going very deep for their power lines. The range of sizes of the foundations is given in the Article 7 application. Um, I don't have those committed to memory. I can look those up here and come back. But they tend to be uh, in the order of like 8 to 12 feet in diameter in that range and usually 30 to 50 feet deep. And I can uh, pull up, uh, I could try to get more specific information on that out of the application so that for this area. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Tell them the question. Sure, yeah, the question was what's going to happen with the spoils from the digging of the foundations. Um, again, that's going to be detailed in the environmental, uh, the EMNCP plan. Um, typically, it is allowed within state regulations to spread soils in upland areas with, with that there's no impacts uh, to environmental uh any environmental sensitivities. Uh, again, that will be detailed in the EMNCP plan. And often 
you know, spoils are hauled off. And certainly if there's anything found that's uh, hazardous in those spoils, uh, then they would be certainly uh, hauled off. So I think that's something we'd come back when we get to that next phase of the process to give you a clearer answer on what the process will be for that. Okay, another question, comment. This is gen generally for the town of Clinton residents. We will participate again in the Article 7 procedures as an intervener and be a party. They're two different categories. Interveners, we get money to hire attorneys and specialists to evaluate questions that we have going through our town. Uh, so we'll work on that as time goes on, but it'll be the same as before. The other one is, uh, will there be any town board approvals obtained? Uh, no, there are no town board approvals obtained. This goes through the Article 7 process, and all local ordinance review is done through that process. And the approvals come from the state for the project. So in other words, we have no local town board oversight of the project, or town planning board, that is, oversight. Okay, just wanted to clarify that. Next one, it, are, in other projects, like when Iroquois gas line went through and all, they gave the town money f to do certain kinds of projects. You couldn't do everything, but certain categories of projects. Uh, will Transco be giving in the town any money that we could do something, uh, improve recreation or whatever their criteria would be? So you're asking about a community benefits yeah. fund. Um, no, Transco will not be offering community benefits funds as a result of this project. This is a ratepayer funded project and that would be an imprudent use of ratepayer funds. When, when you buy your propane or natural gas, you're still a customer, <laughs> so it's no difference. But I just wanted to know, so we all know the rules of what's gonna possibly happen. Does anybody have any other questions? Yeah, come on up if you want. I'm not going to try and be rude, but I got to read off my phone. I got an email from a resident in town uh, with a list of questions. Uh, some you've answered. Um, are there going to be lights on any of the structures or the tallest structures? No, there won't be no lights on the structures. Um, you answered that one. This is a very detailed question. This person was clearly looking online at the maps. Um, but it's a good question. Uh, towers 2301 and 2302 are in a wetland directly south of Bull's Head. Uh, exhibit two of the Transco document states that they will coordinate with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to consult with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Life Service for potential impacts to federally listed threatened and endangered species as well as other federally protected species and habitats. If species of concern are found, then what is the contingent plan? And also, how will they manage to replace the towers with minimal impact to the wetland? So I think you're asking a question about what's to come, and I can't answer what's to come because that's something that would get dictated upon findings and reviews by those agencies that were listed. So I think it's a little premature and irresponsible for me to answer that without knowing what that process would be dictated by those agencies. But that is something we would come back if there were details found. They, we'd let you know what the process is, now that, especially now that we know those areas are of a concern. I can skip one question you asked or answered already. And then the last one is, uh, according to the legend at the bottom of each map, the green area is noted as to be cleaned. And it appears that Transco is widening the corridor minimally. I suspect they need clearance for larger, wider towers. And it is not done everywhere. Uh, how much wide, are you planning on doing any widening, I guess, is what the question is. And, uh, yeah, and why? So there's, there's no widening of the right-of-way. There is tree management, tree removal in certain areas that are shaded green on those maps that we just put up on the website. Um, that is to remove vegetation that is still in the right-of-way. So it's never been cleared, perhaps, to the edge of what the actual right-of-way is, and we need to remove that in order to facilitate the new infrastructure coming in. Yep. Uh, speaking of trees, there is a federal requirement that allows, or a, yeah, requirement that allows the Transco 
to actually go beyond their deeded land that they own if they feel a tree is going to be a problem. And um, they should be talking to the landowner before they cut down the sacred tree, whatever it is uh, that they may be attached to. But just remember, they may go beyond their land based on federal requirements. And I, I'm sure they'll go and tell you that, uh, hey, we're going to cut this tree down or that tree down. But be careful. Once the ink's on a tree, it's generally going to be cut. So you want to try to get it before the ink's on the tree. Um, I, I, can I comment a little bit more? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, so we, we can remove danger trees. That's what Ray is alluding to. It's not a feeling that we have to remove them. They have to actually have a reason for removal, that they are a danger to falling on the lines, which then has a, a potential of um, hurting reliability. So there, that does get examined and will be included in the vegetation work that we do and will be communicated to nearby landowners if that is the case, if we need to do that. That's not something we come in the middle of the night and do without anybody knowing. So we, we would let you know that if that were the case. Go ahead, sorry. Sure. So if there are areas where we have um, significant clearing that needs to be done, we will be setting up appointments with each of those landowners to let them know what to expect with the clearing and where we're anticipating to do it. We're still a little ways out from that. As Nicole was noting, it's really pre preliminary at this point. Um, we're at about a 30% design on the, the structures and the line. So once we do the geotechnical work in advance of the design, we'll have a better sense of, of some of that information, and we will be setting up those meetings to let people know. And I'll add during construction, that's something that's marked out. Um, there will be a bunch of, a rainbow of colors of stakes out there, and Edge of Right of Way is one of them. Right, we just can't get too far ahead of the process. And, you know, we're not, it's not us just going and doing what we want. It's dictated by agencies and review processes and approvals. But when, once we know for sure, that is absolutely something we will let you know. About two years ago, there actually were surveyors that surveyed the property lines, both of them, when they were doing the early analysis. And they put these little tapes tied them onto twigs along the road about every 50 to 150 feet marking that. Now, I don't know if they're still there or not or if they're going to resurvey again. Surveying is expensive, so I don't know. But look for the pattern of those things, and they will cut back to those lines where those plastics are. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people have built their houses and everything else and thought they had this big buffer. And as they said, they haven't cut through here very often. So you may lose a lot of your buffer, but that's, you know, it's their land, they can do what they want with it, but you got accustomed to it. No, um, it's actually, m much of it is owned in fee by National Grid. Yeah. This is just an academic comment. When everybody says taxes, what's going to be, what's going to happen, okay? They're going to remove the old towers, which have been fully depreciated, so essentially they have no value. They're going to put new towers up, which have a definitively high value, we'll say. So their assessment of the land, of, of the towers, my, my mistake, will go up. So they, oops, they're not taking off the others, but their assessment goes up for the towers. The land basically stays the same because the land's a land. Now, the towers are assessed 
by Albany, the land we assess. So you'll see a change there, but that doesn't get included until the project's done in 23 or whatever the number is. So we would have some benefit from it, but then yearly as they start depreciating, then uh, the assessment will go down. So we'll get a boost one year, which will help taxes, and then it'll creep down over time. But I just wanted to let people know there is a little benefit to the town. And we, we are working on trying to get a, a sense of magnitude of what that benefit is for the taxes. So we're doing some research on what National Grid's been paying for the de fully depreciated assets and then an estimate, a range of what we expect ORPS will value these at and then ultimately what the taxable value will be an, an estimate to each town. So that is coming. We're working on it. So here down in Clinton, the two structures, the two lattice style structures carry four 115 kilovolt lines. The new monopole will carry one 115 kilovolt line and one 345 kilovolt line. Um, it's not as simple as adding everything up to compare. Uh, the, new, the new structure with the new lines, it's a different type of capacitor, different type of wires. It's, it's different than what's out there today because standards have changed, requirements have changed, same thing for the structure. Um, so we're building in additional reliability with the structure and design that we're putting out there now. But it's not like you can add up what's out there today and compare it to adding up what's out there tomorrow. It's not, it's not as simple. I'm not an engineer. I don't know if you want to describe it further, but it's much more complicated than, than that. So you want to talk about the Corona? So with lines that are at 345 kV, um, it is possible to get an effect called corona on the lines, um, and it does occur uh, primarily more so in adverse weather uh, conditions, uh, rain and mist. Um, we are within the uh, state guidelines for that is what I can tell you, um, but I, I would have to uh, pull, pull up the report and and to be able to comment any further than that. Yeah, we could, if you want to give us your contact information, we can pull up the report and pull out what the DBA levels are that are in the report and get that back to you. This report will not have that. It is a DBA uh, you know, noise level, it's a, which is a measure of the decibels, the, the noise level. DBA, DBA, yeah, yeah. Anybody else have any questions? Then, did you have a question? Oh, okay. Uh, I hope you found it useful and informative, and we'll have these as time progresses. Uh, when do you think would be the next probable time? Um, I'm, I'm not really sure to answer that, but I, I know that we will probably have the public statement hearings from the public, that are run by the Public Service Commission, and we'll be participating those, giving presentations and answering questions. So that may be the next time that we have a, for, a format similar to this, but that would be for um, 
a broader context of the whole project within other towns as well. So we can work with you though if you have a if you have a need for us to come back at any point in time. We're happy to. You know that. <laughs> Those public hearings that she was talking about typically are collected like three or four towns and they have one place. For example, one time I, in the prior cycle, they had one down in Pleasant Valley, they had one up in Mile End, and they have another one someplace up north further in Columbia County and stuff. So we'll keep you informed of that at town board meetings. I'll announce all of that stuff as it becomes available but I just was trying to get a, a feel. If you think we need them to come back at any other time, just let me know and we will schedule something because we want to be sure you're informed and have your ideas and thoughts taken care of. So with that, I say thank you all and I thank the thank people coming up here and uh, we'll put this on the this on the web page so you can have the download of the PowerPoint and any other information and contact points if you want to call them or do whatever you need. So thank you. Thank you. We're done, Judy.